600 years ago, a mighty civilization ruled over the Andes Mountains, spanning territory that included parts of modern-day Bolivia, Ecuador, Peru, Chile, and Argentina. At its height, the Incan Empire had somewhere between 6 and 14 million people within its borders with hundreds of thousands of warriors at their command, and possessing palaces full of gold and silver. The Incan emperors were the most powerful men in the Western Hemisphere for nearly a century. The empire was so rich in precious metals that when conquistadors under Francisco Pizarro captured Emperor Atahualpa in 1533, they were offered one room full of gold and two full of silver as ransom. Though it only lasted for 95 years, the Incan Empire left behind sites like Machu Picchu as a powerful reminder of its wealth and strength. However, magnificent ruins are not the most haunting memories of the Empire. Neither the are the tales of great wealth or the battles against invading armies. The artifacts left behind by the millions of people who lived within its borders. The most powerful relics left behind by the Inca can be found in the highest peaks of the Andes. Human mummies. Dressed nicely, sometimes adorned with jewellery or other accessories, and almost always children, these mummies are not victims of avalanches or predators discovered centuries later. They are not members of communities that lived high in the mountains, or the remnants of expeditions gone wrong. Instead, the mummies of the Inca are a chilling reminder of a particularly brutal aspect of Incan society, human sacrifice. In this video, we will explain the religious beliefs of the ancient Inca, and examine the reasons behind the Incan version of human sacrifice. It is important to remember that, despite the visceral reminder provided by the mummies of the Andes, human sacrifice was part of the greater religious practices of the Incan people. The Inca believed in a pantheon of powerful deities that directly affected the world around them. In fact, the will of the gods directly affected nearly every aspect of daily life, so it was important to keep them appeased. There were dozens, if not hundreds, of spirits and minor deities, but the most important gods were those that made up the Incan pantheon. Viracocha, Inti, Apu Elapu, and Mama Quila. Viracocha was the creator god, all-powerful and all-knowing. He created the world and everything in it. According to Incan legend, he created the first people, destroyed them when they displeased him, and then recreated people in a new image. This successful second generation pleased Viracocha, so he sent them to the four corners of the world teaching them important skills, he became the spiritual protector of the first Incan emperor, Pachacuti Inca Yupanqui. Though his most important contributions happened before the empire was founded, Viracocha was held in such high esteem that he was honoured with an idol the size of a small child that was made out of pure gold. Though Viracocha may have been the god who created the world, Inti, was the most revered god in the pantheon. As the sun god of the Inca, Inti was naturally incredibly important to a society that was overwhelmingly agrarian. Crops thrived or died by the will of Inti, so the mood of the sun god was considered a matter of literal life or death for the Inca people. Farmers especially worshipped and loved Inti, for obvious reasons. Inti was so important to the empire that when the Incan emperor died, his organs were burned as a gift to the god, and the ashes of said organs were placed with the ashes of the previous emperors inside of the idol of Inti. This idol was a golden sculpture of a child with sun rays protruding from its head, and was believed to provide an active link between humanity and the sun. Inti was so important that the temple devoted to him featured a sculpture of a crop of corn made from solid gold. 
Every year, the reigning emperor would farm this golden crop to show his devotion to the sun god, though Viracocha was eventually seen as the top of the pantheon. Inti was originally seen as the most powerful Incan god. Though the sun is important for crops, rain is as well, so it is not surprising that another important god in Incan religion was Apu Ilapu, the god of rain and thunder. Though not as revered or powerful as Inti, Apu Alapu was respected in his own right. When droughts would threaten crops, the Inca would make pilgrimages to the rain god's temples. Since these were located at the tops of high structures, these were not casual journeys. Furthermore, it was believed that the Milky Way was Apu Alapu's shadow. It was from here that the Inca believed rain came from. Apu Alapu drew the water from the vastness of his shadow, and then poured it on the world as rain. Last but not least in our look into Incan religion is Mama Quila, goddess of the moon. The wife of Inti, Mama Quila, controlled the moon's cycles of waxing and waning. This was an incredibly important role in Incan society because they operated on a lunar calendar model. The phases of the moon directly coincided with the Incan calendar, and the Inca based their festivals on a monthly basis. Silver was thought to be Mama Quila's tears, and certain constellations were prayed to for luck and protection. Furthermore, Mama Quila also controlled the menstrual cycles of women. This did not translate to fertility, which was the concern of another goddess, but rather to the importance of reliability and predictability of important passings of time. The Inca based their lives and religion on monthly cycles. As the goddess who controlled the moon, Mama Quila was arguably the deity in control of time itself, or at least the ability for humans to understand it and use it. Clearly, the Incan pantheon of gods was incredibly important to the daily life of the Inca. So how did this importance translate to daily life and the corporeal world? The most obvious feature of religion in Incan society, and the part most visible to us today, were temples. All of the gods we discussed previously had temples located throughout the empire. Each temple had a certain number of priests or priestesses, dedicated to the worship of whichever deity the temple was associated with. Since several of these temples are still standing today, we know that they are generally large stone buildings, and that they were built in a variety of locations. As we already mentioned, Apu Alapu's temples were built on the top of tall structures. The most important temple in the empire, Korakancha, was dedicated to the sun god, Inti. It was where the golden crop of corn was located, and where the emperors went annually to pay homage to Inti. According to eyewitness accounts, the temple walls were covered in gold, and the courtyard was filled with golden statues. Though it was destroyed during the Spanish conquest, the temple was large enough that its remains were used as the foundation for the Santo Domingo convent when it was built in the late 1600s. Temples were not only places of worship, they were also tools of conquest. When the Inca conquered a new territory, they quickly erected temples. This served two purposes. To praise the gods for their victory, and to begin exposing the newly conquered subjects to the official religion of the Incan Empire. Since temples required considerable time and expense to build, the Incas also worshipped their gods using shrines, which in this case were basically mini-temples. All temples and shrines had an idol representing the god or goddess they were associated with. They also had a complement of priests, assistants, and chosen women that tended the idol and preparing for rituals. Shrines also appeared in newly conquered lands, though they were obviously less imposing than temples. To appease the gods, the Incan people relied on rituals and sacrifices, which we will discuss shortly. However, to interpret the will of the gods, the Inca used divination. 
Divination included everything from interpreting the messages of oracles to unraveling the finer details of natural events, such as watching a line of spiders walk in a certain direction, or dropping coca leaves in a bowl and analysing the pattern in which they fell. It was through divination that priests learned the correct times and ways to sacrifice to the god, and how Incan emperors made important decisions. If it was a problem with important consequences, such as war, succession, drought, or natural disaster, divination was believed to hold the answer. In a world where the lives of millions of people are held in the palms of a group of divine beings that control every aspect of nature, it would be incredibly important to ensure that they remained in good moods. This is the situation the Inca believed themselves to be in with things like rain, sunlight, and even the passing of time being determined by the will of their gods. To keep the deities happy, ancient Incans provided them with gifts in the form of sacrifices. Sacrifice in the Incan Empire ranged in scale from massive spectacle to daily routine. Though divination was the path to understand the gods, sacrifice was the most active part of religion in the daily life of the ancient Inca. The beginning of every Inca's day started with throwing a handful of corn into the fire. The sacrifice was intended for the sun god, Inti, and was accompanied by the mantra, Eat this, Lord Sun, so that you will know that we are your children. The emperor himself also participated in a daily sacrifice. At the end of each day, the emperor's poncho was burned as a sacrifice to Inti, in order to reaffirm the imperial connection to the sun god. Plants and animals were common sacrificial offerings. Guinea pigs, llamas, coca leaves, chicha, and more were sacrificed depending on the context. Much like divination, sacrifice was involved in all major events and moments of crisis. For example, the Inca ushered in each new lunar month with a large sacrificial act. At the beginning of the new lunar cycle, 100 pure white llamas were selected from local herds. They were then gathered, checked for blemishes and injuries, and driven by a priest through the city of Cuzco, the empire's capital. Once they had reached the great square in the middle of the city, they were sacrificed as a thank you for the beginning of the new month. This was obviously a far larger ritual than the day-to-day -day sacrifices carried out by the common people, and the fact that so many valuable animals were disposed of every month in the name of gods shows the importance of sacrificial acts in the worship of the Incan gods. Animal and crop sacrifices were the most common forms of sacrificial worship found in the Incan Empire, but on occasion a circumstance would arise where the divine clout earned from these sacrifices was not considered to be enough. When drought, war, famine, disease, or the death of an emperor occurred, Incan priests had an ace up their sleeve. Desperate times called for desperate measures. Human sacrifice. Before this topic is explored any further, it is important to make one thing clear. Human sacrifice in the Incan Empire was not used as a form of torture. Though images of blood-based rituals, beating hearts, and decapitations often come to mind when the topic of human sacrifice is mentioned, it is important to remember that different cultures believe in different rituals. These concepts of sacrifice may be accurate when considering the Maya or the Aztec, extreme examples though they may be. Images of screaming priests mutilating human bodies could not be further from the truth when it comes to the topic of human sacrifice in the Incan Empire. Called Capacocha by the Inca, human sacrifice was reserved for very significant events or circumstances. It wasn't rare per se, but it was nowhere near as common as the types of animal and plant sacrifices that have been discussed. The most common reasons for priests to use capacocha were things like famine, military defeats, or the death of an emperor. Though the Incan method of sacrifice was arguably more humane than its Mayan or Aztec counterparts, one detail of capacocha strikes an uncomfortable chord with modern values. The people chosen for sacrifice were, overwhelmingly, children. Children were chosen for two reasons. Sacrifices had to be as blemish-free and pure as possible, and sacrifice was viewed as an honour. 
In the minds of the ancient Inca, the children who were given to the gods were not only proving their own piety, but the piety of their family as well. Having a child used for Capacocha gave a family both a direct link to the gods and to the emperor himself. In fact, the social status received from Capacocha was so great that the children chosen or volunteered for it were usually the children of local chiefs. The significance of human sacrifice in Incan religion meant that it was a standardized event. Priests followed a routine that had been used for generations every time a person was sacrificed. The first step was to ensure that the selected child, or person, had no blemishes, deformities, illnesses, or anything else that would detract from the purity of the sacrifice. Luckily for the priests, the selection pool was pretty deep. Conquered provinces were forced to provide children as candidates for Capacocha as part of a tax owed to the emperor. Once a child or children had been chosen, they were led by the priests associated with the specific god that needed to be appeased on a procession to the capital city of Cusco. The priest went with them, and the procession was greeted with praise in whichever towns and cities they passed through. When the group arrived in Cusco, they were treated to a series of feasts and rituals. It was important that the children be well fed and content before they were sacrificed, so that they wouldn't be crying when they first met the gods. Once the feasts and ceremonies in Cusco had finished, the procession was led to a nearby high mountain. A base camp was set up on a lower peak while priests and workers prepared the formal sacrificial site. The burial site was prepped and stone platforms were constructed. The platforms were then turned into walls, which were placed together to form a sort of chamber. Once these preparations had been finished, the area was ready for the final act, the sacrifice itself. The details of the actual sacrifice were never written down by the Inca themselves, or at least no records have survived. All written accounts of the ceremony were created by conquistadors and Spanish explorers who witnessed a sacrifice. And since they were not aware of the nuances and reasoning behind this activity, neither are modern scholars. As they faced their last day on Earth, the child chosen for the Capacocha ceremony was given chicha, an alcohol made from fermented maize. Though the true reasoning for this is unknown, it was most likely to ease their nerves, help them tolerate the weather and the altitude, and possibly to cleanse them in some way. Once the child reached the sacrificial platform, they would be wrapped in ceremonial clothing, while the priests that were present conducted rituals. Once this was complete, the child was placed inside the tomb and surrounded with ancient artifacts that would go with them to the land of the gods. This is where the certainty ends and the mystery begins. The way that each sacrifice was killed is an ongoing debate amongst scholars fueled by the fact that the mummies that had been found were not all killed by the same method, most of them have some form of skull fracture, which would make sense. Children left in the cold with no food would undoubtedly suffer and panic, so knocking them out beforehand would have been a way to make their passing more humane, and to ensure the body remained as unflawed as possible. One theory is that the blow was cushioned with some sort of towel or pad, but this cannot be proven. Though the majority of mummies possess skull fractures, it is not a universal trait. Some of them have been found with vomit on their clothing, implying either extreme stress or altitude sickness. Others show signs that they were killed by strangulation, though at least one of the main examples of a mummy being strangled seems to have been a non capacocha related killing. Even more morbidly, some of the mummies that have been found have no damage or marks of any kind. Though this seems comforting at first, the lack of any external damage means that these mummies were either killed by the elements, starved to death, or died from the stress of hunger and extreme weather combined. It is possible that there was no universal method of killing the people chosen for Capacocha, and that it was a matter of the preference of the priest that oversaw each ceremony. It is also possible that the method for killing was revealed in a divination session conducted of the ceremony or that a certain event or circumstance corresponded with a certain method of execution, 
Regardless, the mummies found serve as a chilling reminder of the strength of the ancient Incan faith in their gods and the consequences of upsetting them. Though the mummies of the Inca stand in opposition to modern views on religion and the sanctity of human life, they provide a rare glimpse into the religion of the Incan Empire. The bodies of children found high in the peaks of the Andes are a reminder of the past, and a tool of investigation that historians covet as much as any temple or jewel. The specific circumstances of their deaths may elude us forever, but one thing is certain. They and their families believed that their sacrifice would benefit millions of others, and that they would leave the flawed world behind and enter the realm of their gods.